Joining us now, Scott Bland, editor of Politico's Campaign Pro and host of the Nerdcast. Thank you for joining us, Scott. Thank you very much. Well, so the Trump administration has had tough words for Iran. At the same time, though, they say that Iran is complying with the nuclear deal. Where do they go from here? Well, I think the thing to keep in mind is that some of this rhetoric may not only be aimed at Iran, but also at a domestic audience. You know, the Donald Trump ran for president uh, on a platform of undoing a great deal of what the Obama administration had done both domestically and on foreign policy. And he talked numerous times about tearing up the Iran nuclear deal. So while the administration is now acknowledging that Iran is in compliance with the deal at this point, they still need to uh, to continue to, to talk tough. And also, you know, th there's an element of this. I mean, Iran is, is working to kind of create uh, geopolitical instability in, in a number of, of places around the globe that are against U.S. interests. And so the, it all kind of ties together in, into a bigger picture. So is there a sense that these concerns about U.S. credibility on the line here with the foreign policy towards Iran. You're saying that this is such a campaign issue for many folks. But do vote, we're talking 2018, do folks really, are they concerned about issues? Do they vote on referendums like the Iran deal? Are they concerned about North Korea? Does that make its way to the ballot box? I think it's, there's a lot of time between now and November 2018, and I think what happens in that time is going to have a lot to do with that. I do know that in 2016, Republican operatives felt that tying Senate Democrats and House Democrats to the Iran nuclear deal was one of their best lines of attack, uh, especially against candidates who may or may not have had a voting record with you know, other bits and pieces for them to go after. They really felt like that was a good attack line for them in 2016. Again, there's a while to go before we get to 2018, but th there's, there's definitely some, some past patterns there. Uh, to, to indicate that they might want to do that again. And Scott, you talked about, you know, sharp rhetoric, but at this stage, you know, talk is cheap. Uh, President Trump has said a number of things on the campaign trail that have not turned out to be true policy-wise. To repeal and replace Obamacare immediately, it still isn't done, although there's maybe a last-ditch effort to, to make it happen. Labeling China a currency manipulator, which he now says he won't do. He also said within 90 days he will issue a report on Russian election hacking. That has yet to be done. Is there by now, as we approach this 100-day mark, a credibility issue on the part of the administration? Well, I think it depends on who you ask. I think, uh, by and large, it seems like from every indication we got from polling and, and other measurements, the folks who voted for him are still relatively happy with him, at least most of them are. Now, the question at that point is, he won by such a narrow margin that once you start shaving even one or two percentage points off that, uh, it becomes a problem. But, uh, you know, I think at the moment we're not seeing a, a big, um, a lot of movement in his his numbers, for example, you know, they're they're not good. They're, he's kind of stuck in this low 40s approval rating, and I think maybe that that speaks a little bit to concerns people had uh, about him before he became president. But I, I'm not entirely sure that what he's doing right now is changing much of anything. I want to ask you about con comments from Congressman and DNC Deputy Chair Keith Ellison. He said that President Obama is partially to blame for Democratic losses. Do you think? that there needs to be a rebuilding of the Democratic Party. And is there a new strategy that you're hearing for 2016, for 2018? Uh, well, w with regard to uh, kind of pinning some of the blame on, on President Obama, I think that's probably fair. I mean, he was the leader of the party for eight years, during which time he was reelected and the party kept a Senate majority for, for most of his term. But otherwise, things were pretty bleak for Democrats in the House, at the state and local level. Um, culminating in the 2016 election and the loss of his uh, his favorite candidate, Hillary Clinton. Um, so, you know, I think that as a result of that, Democrats are at this point talking about doing a rebuilding, a rebooting, but there are a number of competing theories of the case about how to do that. Just in the past day, we've seen um, a little bit of a, at least a verbal breakdown and kind of messaging from Bernie Sanders and some others about what kind of Democrats uh, he he would like to be backing and notably omitting uh, Georgia Democrat John Ossoff, who's the much watched special election candidate right now from from that list. When asked if he was a progressive, he said kind of dismissively, "I don't know." So you know, I think there's a lot of different uh, different theories bouncing around at this point. But it's very clear that the Democratic Party does want to do something to to rebuild itself for sure. And do Democrats 
want to be the opposition to President Trump. I mean, as we approach uh, the 100-day mark, there will be, in order to avoid a government shutdown, some type of budget agreement among Democrats and Republicans here in the next few weeks. As Republicans hint, Speaker Ryan saying they're close to a health care compromise after failing uh, massively a few weeks ago, is, you know, President Trump has, has seemed to indicate that he's open to working with Democrats. Uh, do Democrats see working with Trump as part of the formula? For success? Uh, I think so far on the issues that have come up, they don't. Um, it remains to be seen what exactly might happen on a tax reform package, for example, or an infrastructure package, right. any number of other issues. But a part of it is contingent on uh, the White House, too. And what we've seen in health care, in what's happened in Congress so far, there has not been Republican outreach to Democrats to bring them in. So I think it, it's a little bit of a two way street. And before we let you go, I want to ask you, Speaker Paul Ryan said that they're very close on health care. There's also a looming budget deadline just days away. Where do you think Republican lawmakers need to focus when they return from recess next week? Well, I think uh, in terms of where they need to focus, I think the, you know, keeping, keeping the government funded is a, a pretty high priority, I would imagine. Uh, obviously, health care continues to be a big animating uh, factor in the Republican base that, that helped so many of these members of Congress get elected. And so this is... Uh, the repeal and replace of Obamacare is something that they really want to do and uh, from a uh, base politics perspective uh, it's very easy to understand why this continues to be a big focus for them. All right, Scott Bland is the editor of Politico's uh, Campaign Pro and host of Nerdcast. What's on your next episode? What are you featuring? <laughs> What are you focusing uh, on? We're, we're talking special elections. We're talking FEC deadlines, all the, all the nerdiest political stuff we can think of. That well, is I, nerdy. I think it's pretty cool. It's nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, all Scott. Right, Scott. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank you.